Hello there. Welcome to your third day of build, third and last day. So hopefully you guys saw a lot of cool stuff and announcement demos, learned some new technologies. And you probably heard about this little thing called serverless. So we want to you know, really make sure you can use that when you get out of here, when you go back to work on Monday, you have your own challenges within your business that you want to solve. And how do you really apply those things? Like you have microservice architectures. How do you want to build your APIs and have them serverless? You have to integrate with ton of, tons of services out there. You can use the service technology. So we're going to go through a lot of a real business case scenario here. So if you guys are into dogs, we're going to talk about dogs a little bit beyond serverless and, uh, and introduce a business case scenario that we made for this. But a lot of the problems you can map to, to your organization problems. But before we go into dogs, uh, introduce ourselves. Yeah, sure. Uh, so I'll start. Uh, I am Jeff Holland. I'm a program manager on the Azure team. Uh, I focus on Azure Logic Apps. And so we are going to talk about dogs here. Uh, hopefully, you are all fans of dogs. If you are cat people, uh, there's plenty of space to just leave the arena if you would like to. Uh, <laughs> no. uh, but my, my feelings on dogs right now, honestly, I'm usually a great dog person. I grew up with dogs. But right like last week, my neighbor just bought a new puppy. It is a poodle. And she has decided that at nighttime, because it's Seattle and it's always cold and raining, that she wants that poodle to hang out in the garage of their house, which is right outside my bedroom window. So for the last week, all I hear all night is this terrible howling. Uh, so I'm a little bit torn today. We're going to be giving some love to dogs, but uh, I'm, not, I'm not really feeling it right now. Uh, <laughs> but we'll have a lot of fun today. We're going to talk about serverless. We're going to make it uh, interesting for you all. And just kind of finishing up my introduction, you're going to see some of the coolest demos that you have seen all week in this session. Uh, so get ready for that. And if my mic goes out, it's fine. I'm loud enough. You're up, Eduardo. <laughs> um, so I'm a, a PM on the Azure Functions. I do a lot of our integration scenarios, how to use functions to build APIs and app service in general. Um, I grew up with dogs. I grew up with uh, Brazilian Mastiff. I didn't know that was a name in English until I researched yesterday. Um, and how is, let's go back into our business scenario so you see how, how dogs uh, are relevant here. So what Jeff and I for today, we decided to do is we had this vision of build this business where your dog would look great anywhere in the world. So with that, we're launching our Build Dog Spa. There are grooming services in 16 locations around the world. And we started off the gate ambitious. And we have to monitor how the business is doing in each one of these locations. We'll watch the revenue, and depending how it's doing, we might trigger off some promotions to boost up the, the traffic and, and the revenue. And today, this process is controlled with just simple spreadsheets. So we want to make this serverless and automate that a bit. So from mobile app on our phone, we can control and we can trigger, trigger those promotions on each one of our branches. And we have a set of different promotions. We have cutest pet event, and you take your pet, there is a contest, you get a coupon, and, and that increases traffic on, on that particular store. So we built the, the architecture that we want to cover here. What do you see in terms of the blue arrows or the pieces that we're, we're really going to show and that you could replicate with your own business problems? Um, from, from the left to right, we have this application that we want to run that could be running on our phone, could be running on a browser. But what we really want to show is running it on Power Apps, because it's a really great Microsoft product for you to build business apps quickly that look good and run everywhere. Um, and that application, we use our API through the API definition. We're going to show how we made that easier. And we are initially going to apply functions and logic apps for our scenarios. But that's our initial application. We want to prototype quickly. We want to have a proof of concept, something we can show you guys. But we might swap the back end at some point. So we put that. That's the green icons you see. We put that behind proxies. So that can be changed very easily without us having to change the client. So And the last thing we're going to do is the dog grooming estimate, where we can take a look at the dog, take a picture of a dog, and estimate how much, how much it costs to, to groom that dog. And that integrates with external APIs. That's going to be logic apps. So let me, I'm going to show the function first, 
Before I go into the function, um, I'm going to do a quick recap real quick on serverless, in case some of you um, haven't been uh, <laughs> hearing enough about serverless. The reason we like in our particular build spot, uh, dog spot business, is because we don't have to worry about, when we do these prototypes, we don't have to worry about what does the machine look like, what's the CPU, how much memory we have to take. We can just go straight into the code. Um, we don't know if our business is really going to pick up. At first, it's going to be low traffic, but it might really increase. So we like deploying something that will scale as the business grows. And, and we only, only want to pay for what's really running, uh, the amount of time it CPUs runs. So that leaves us time to do, on the DevOps side, to do more of the dev and likely less of the ops, because we don't have to worry about those servers. We'll have more time to focus on the business logic and prototype very quickly. Um, a lot of the things we do here, you can do that within hours, really. Those are not super complex for you to get started. And in Azure, what we have at the core of serverless, the two main components, as you can see on my shirt, <laughs> uh, are functions and logic apps. Functions as your real coding dev experience, um, and you have all the tooling available. We launched a bunch of them in the other sessions we announced. Uh, you can do it in Visual Studio. You can do them through the portal. I'm going to show here. Fully open source. And you have Logic Apps that integrates with over 100 services, and Jeff is going to talk more about Logic Apps. But for your application to be truly serverless, you want to make sure the other pieces beyond compute are also serverless, such as your storage layer, messaging layer. For this demo, I'm going to use Azure Tables, but you could use DocumentDB for storage and stay serverless. For messaging, you could use Event Hubs, and so on and so forth. Um, so let me switch and um, show you the first function I want, to, um, I want to highlight. And that's a function that we're going to plug in with the, with the front end. Um, so what we have here, I'm on the Azure portal, and I have a a function that I built that I'm going to open here for you guys to see through the portal. Um, and the first part of the function, actually, I want to show is the integrate tab. That's where you define what triggers your function. A function can be HTTP, can be based on a timer, can be based on an event. This one's HTTP, so receives a, a request and has a response as an answer. But what, what I really like is that I was able to bind this to an Azure table storage. Um, and all I have to configure here is my storage account name, the name of my table, and a parameter, which is how I'm going to refer to that um, table within my code. And the table, just for fun, I'm going to show it to you guys here. And this is um, Azure Storage Explorer. It's, it's um, pretty simple. It's here with my promotions. Um, and my promotions basically um, will have information on the promotion, the name, the description and the branches where it applies to you. Azure Stories Explorer is taking a second, but here it is. So you have the name of the promotions, the silent auction, and the description of what it is, and the branches where it applies to. Not all promotions can be run in every branch, so we did it this way to start with. So now back to, to the code on this function, um, and I showed how I can connect to the table storage, and that name was dog spot table. And the great thing I like is I don't have to manipulate the table to fill in all my objects. I declare my, object, my class down here, and, and as data comes, it will automatically serialize into that object, and I'll be able to manipulate them inside my function. As you can see here, there are not, um, there are not real many lines of code, really, that deal with the table. Most of my code is really the business logic of let me read that, match to the ID. I take the ID of the branch as a parameter. I'll compare that with my table and see which promotions apply for that given branch. And, and on, on the output, the same way, all I return is a list of objects as well that get deserialized and sent as a JSON back to the consumer of that API. And that's a pretty simple function. I could probably make it even shorter, but um, just for you to understand a little bit how we call this function. And we can test it out right here through the test tab. So this, this I said, takes an ID as a, as a parameter. So I can just provide the input parameter right here on the test tab, click run, and that, that will run my function and return the JSON object here. I could try a different ID. 
and it will return the, the promotions that apply to that branch. That will get more interesting visually once we show the Power Apps, but show you just, just for you to get your API working, your function working in this case um, here. You could try that on Postman or through the browser as well. Can you zoom in just a touch too? Oh, yeah. yeah. All right, all right, okay. Sorry, it's harder to navigate. I yeah, know. yeah, no, that's good. I'm just trying to make your life challenging, Eduardo. You're too good at this. <laughs> You've done it too many times. Um, and just to show the, the output, um, it's just simple JSON. Um, and um, I could put it um, different enter, but let me, go, let me go back here and actually switch back to the slides so I can show you guys the API layer and how I'm going to actually put this function behind, uh, behind a, a proxy. Before, before I show the demo, one thing we invested on is functions by nature, as you declare a function to be HTTP, it is an API and responds to HTTP requests. But a true API that you want to have clients consume out there, you have to define how it looks like. Your routes, you have to compose that API, different routes will route to different backends, and you want to control that API in a single place. So those are challenges you typically have as you're building them. Also, modify requests and response. Not all your backends are going to respond the same way. Some's going to take query string parameters. Some's going to take something out of the URL path. So you want to map those into a, co a cohesive API. And you want the API to be serverless. So you can do a lot of that without being confused like this gentleman on the icon there. <laughs> um, and we're going to show you the, how you do that. So one common scenario we see is Within your API, you're going to have your source code coming from different branches or different depots altogether. And they will deploy to different functions in a common scenario. You deploy them, and then your client will get to access multiple, multiple functions. They are not within a single API. So you have to make changes. You would have to make changes in this particular case in three different places. So one thing we can do is instead of you having a client that have to call all these different function apps, you can add to one given function app additional proxies that will map those calls to other functions backends. And you see the products and orders in this case, they map to different function apps than the one that the mobile client's calling. You can actually swap that backend to any backend, really. It's just a URL. It's just a routing functionality. Um, another pattern we see as people are building solutions is just uh, single page applications where they will have the root of their application point to an HTML file, and that application, as it picks up details on that customer, calls a function, let's say, to render um, a personalized ad to put on the page, and that can run as you load your page. And all you have to do is call back into that same function app through another route. Um, so those are some of the scenarios we see with proxies today, but uh, um, I wanted to, to show actually proxies working. So I'm going to create a, I have another function here. I'm going to start from scratch so you can do that yourself as well. And this function doesn't have anything yet. So I'm going to create a few proxies. The other thing I did in my storage account was all the images we need to use in our promotions, they're all here as well. And they all have a, because they're in blob storage in Azure, they all have a, an endpoint uh, to those images that you can access. Um, they're right here. Um, Right? So all, all of those work, but I might change the location of those images later. Right? They, they work today. So I could put this behind a proxy so I can swap that back end without having to, to change my API. So I could just call it promo image. This initial name here on the proxy is, is, um, is just for your internal management. Um, you decide on the route template here, so you could call it images. If you want. Um, you can customize the parameters. So let's pick the name of the image here um, on the URL path and pass that to my backend URL. I could also decide which HTTP methods we're going to route, which ones will be blocked. And the name I'm just going to replace here uh, with name of the image. And that's it. And, you create, and the proxy is created and it's working. So we're going to test this out. So this one is Bellevue icon. So we just have to replace this with Bellevue icon. And it should route to, to the same backend. Let me just see if I did this did right. Did you save it in the function portal? 
Let's see if I saved it. It's good. Live debugging. Oh, you did save it. Oh, yes. Thank you. Aha. Uh -huh. Which is good. So now, what I forgot to show you is that this is, this is a new feature. So you have to enable the feature for, for your entire function app. So thank you. Such a helpful audience. Yeah, nice. Honestly. This was, this was great. I hope we have swag for all of them. I know. We're going to invite them to actually demo this up here for <laughs> us. OK. So now Proxies is enabled. Let's try it again. For fun. I don't know if it let you save it, though. We'll try. Uh, live demo. Fun. So this will hit up that function. Uh, that function only contains proxies for now. It doesn't contain any code. So you can add your functions to it as well. And I'll do that in parallel here. Um, I'm just going to create a function to show that you can route things to a function quickly. So create the default function. It doesn't really matter too much which function it is for this scenario. Um, it's the hello world function. And I could put that function behind the proxy. I'll copy that one. Let's see. OK, this is working now. Yay. Um, and let's see my hello world function. This is working. Tough to see, but it says, please pass a name to your query. So the same way, I could create a proxy that maps to your function. So you go here, you call uh, your proxy function route, whatever internal name you want. I'll call this function. And I can map, uh, put my back end here. Um, it's a little bit of cheating. You go from authenticated endpoint that has an API key to a point that's not authenticated. So I do not advise to do that at home. but. Um, <laughs> But you could. It makes a great demo. <laughs> yeah, it makes it easy to demo. But yeah, so it, it works the same way. And we could, you could make this fancier. We could get that name. That's a query string. Transform that in a URL path as well. Uh, and do all that good stuff. So name. And I think this takes a name as a parameter. So you do name equals name. I know I'm trying my luck here, but OK. Copy, I go there. Let's see, Jeff, my favorite guy. OK, hello, Jeff. So, so it's that easy for you to create a proxy, right? So, and this is actually not the latest, latest. The latest, as of three days ago, is that you can actually mock up your API. So think of the case where you know, you're talking to your front end dev, and you're still deciding, hey, how should our API look like, right? And you don't have a back end. Neither he has a front end, but, but you're trying to decide on that. So you can come here to the, to the function, and you can go platform features and get our app service editor. That editor can work on top of any of your function files. Um, the proxies that we show through the UI, they get saved on a file called proxies.json. And that file, you can, you can edit them anywhere, really. The app service editor, the good thing it makes is know the JSON schema. So it, it's kind of it's handy for you to edit your proxy. Um, I'm not particularly. Can you zoom in a little bit? Super on good on this. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. So, um, so you can create a new proxy here. Um, you name that proxy. So say mock. That's the internal, just your internal name for management purposes. Um, and you, and here you can see you can get all the hints here, um, and autocomplete and all that good stuff. You decide on your route. And I'm gonna do route. Gonna call them a mock. Uh, Mock route, that is good. And here, what I can start doing is um, uh, I can start actually modifying my, my request. Um, oh, sorry. Thank you. Thank you. Man, it's like a thousand people to debug your code. There's awesome. A, you okay. Comma there too. <laughs> Don't forget your comma. <laughs> Don't forget your comma. Yes. Okay. Hold on. Sorry. Okay. It's All right. Beautiful. All right. So now, this is the new part, the request, res request and response override. So you could either, as you're routing to a back end, as the request is coming in, you could change that request before you send the back end. Let's say change something in the header, add an additional header that wasn't there in the original request. And on the way back, you could change the response as well. So you could do your response override here for time-saving reasons. I'm going to just. Uh, Copy one that I had somewhere around here. And um, so you can see that, uh, that proxy working. Um, so I had another one here. Let me go back. Um, and I'll, I'll just copy the JSON so you're not going to see my live JSON and be able to 
debug where, where I'm doing it wrong. So I'm going to show one here. This one. Um, this one I had created the mock before. So I'm just gonna I'm gonna show you how it looks like. Oh, hold on. Do this again. Authenticate again. So basically, once I um, once I get that uh, the JSON file, then um, you you'll see all the properties that are available for you to to create your request on on the fly. Um, you see that here, when it's a mock, the UX is not going to show a backend URL because it doesn't have a backend URL. It will hit the proxy, and uh, the response will will come back. See if I can get there now. All right. So this one has a has a mock in it that I want to show you. Um, and while it's, it's authenticating um, here, okay, so let me show you this one. Okay, so let me increase the font. Okay, so here's one that we did to return as we're, we're building some of our APIs to return some of the promotions. So what we did on the response override, what we did was we configured the status code, the type of response, and we altered the body of, of, that, um, of that route. So now within that route, this one is on a different place. So this one is export PA demo. Uh, let's show this one. Uh, and, and if I do this, it takes an ID as a parameter and returns your mock data right there and never hits any backend. So now if, let's say, your client is using this, uh, this particular route, all you have to do is change, the, change your proxy and add your backend URI here and remove all this mock data, and that would route to an actual backend. So very easy for you to start prototyping your, your API with proxies. And continue on the API front. So let's say now you have all your proxies, thinking of that solution we first presented. Um, you want to build that all up into, into your Swagger file, or open API, as it's called, which is a standard out there. And and you know, most devs we talk to, they don't particularly love doing YAML editing on Swagger. That's not what they do on Weekend for Fun. So we try to help a little bit with that. So you don't, because we already know when you're building a function, you already know the routes that you're using, you know which verbs you enabled, we know your security settings. So we feel like we can really help you get started with that so you're not starting from, from scratch. Um, the other good thing is if you use this feature, then you can host the Swagger within your function itself. We do the automatically hosting for you, so you don't have to host it elsewhere. So let me show you that, too. Um, that one, I had created a function. So let me go back to the one I was using where I created the function app that I was using, the Playground one. I created a function here. So it's a very simple function. That's the only thing that exists there. So the Swagger is going to be somewhat simple. What I can do here is decide which HTTP verbs it, um, it's going gonna, it's gonna to respond to. Just to make my swagger a little shorter, I'm only going to keep post for fun. And now if I go to the, the function app, you're going to see the API definition. It's under preview, also one of our newer features. And once you enabled it to be from the function, we're going to load up the Swagger editor here. Um, and the Swagger editor now knows about your endpoint, knows about your, your, where your function responds to, as you can see here, knows about your operations and, and secure definitions and create your initial Swagger. So, and it's hosted at this endpoint here, which is defined under a different uh, API definition key. So it's protected uh, as well. And you could see the definition key here. Um, this is a standard open source editor. You can use this editor to test out your, your API. So here, different than the test tab I showed for functions, you're testing out the API as defined on the Swagger. Um, so if you change things here, this test frame on the right, it would change as well. Um, I had cheated to complete my Swagger here. I had this one, just it has the additional input parameters. So I'm not doing live editing. I have that one here. 
Um, so this one's the valid swagger to, to the same endpoint. And um, what we can do is we can authenticate that API. And you can grab the API key from the function here. Um, so let's do that. Get the API key for that function. Here we show we showed all the keys. Don't memorize it. Use it later. Um, we go back there on the API definition. Enter that key. Uh, let's paste that in again because I did not hit save. Uh, okay. Oh, so I'll start the key. <laughs> uh -huh. Nice. I need that too. Okay. I put my key over here. <laughs> Do this one. It's good. I'm trying to see if people can spot more more errors here. I should give prizes, like you said. Okay. You have your API key. Let me go back. Get it from here. Enter. Okay. Now it's authenticated. Then you can try the operation. This one is the hello world one. So all it takes is a name. Hopefully it's work. Let's go Jeff again, because he's popular. And this will go to your back end, which is pointing to your function. And um, we'll use the API key, authenticate, and put the response back here. Uh, ha, probably I did something wrong. But you guys get the gist of it, how you can do this yourselves. Um, so now let me go back and actually give it to Jeff. We'll continue on how to use that Swagger or a different one yep. to leverage that on, on a different application. Yep. Thanks, Eduardo. Uh, so bringing it back to uh, the business scenario, if you remember when we started, so Eduardo and I, we've got this amazing dog spa, way better than the dog spa in the Windows keynote yesterday that they showed in that story app. Ours is 1,000 times better than that. I guess it's dog spa week. Um, and we had this logic now that Eduardo has built for us. And because he used serverless, he was able to do it very quickly, right? If there's one thing I want you to take away in terms of why would I choose serverless, serverless is all about letting you build and ship your applications much faster. You don't have to worry about how it's hosted, how it's scaled. You just defined, I think you had like 30 lines of code. It will scale at cloud scale. So if our dog spot takes off, if all of you leave and go wash your dogs there uh, or yourselves there, we're fine as long as you give us money. Uh, then it will scale up for us. Now, he's written this logic, the one he did in his function, which will say, hey, here's the different promos that worked at different locations, right? Because maybe we'll, in Seattle, we'll have like a rainy day promotion, which goes great in Seattle. But if we went to Death Valley, California, and we had a rainy day promotion, uh, it would never jive. So he's written this logic. But the challenge that we now have is that it's back-end logic. It's now sitting there in the cloud. And we need to somehow be able to access it. I, as an employee, need to be able to know what are the promotions for this branch. So traditionally, as a developer, you've got a few different choices. You can either uh, go write a website. So now I've got to go host a whole website that calls this API and surfaces the information. Maybe if I want it to be mobile, I've got to go build a mobile app, maybe a Xamarin app, which again is going to take a bunch of time and effort to do. Very valid uh, option. And there's some slick tools to help you get there. But the one that we're actually going to use for our business is a Power App. Now, I'm curious here, how many in the room here have heard of or used Microsoft Power Apps before? OK, so about half. So Power Apps is part of the Office suite. It's a newer offering, became generally available late last year. And it's for building line of business applications. And the reason that it's powerful in some ways is because you can get them up and running very quickly. So actually, before I even go back to the function, I'm going to show you the start of a Power App that we have in our business. Now, this is Power App Studio. Uh, you can install it and run it across Windows, Android, and iOS. But it looks, you know, I said it's part of Office. It looks actually very much like an Office application, right? Where in like PowerPoint, I would have the different slides of my presentation on the left-hand side. Here, I actually see the different screens that our app has. And I'm able to connect this application to data as well. So you notice here, pretty simply in our Power App, all we're doing is we're showing information on the different branches that we have. So I can come in here and figure out, you know, hey, in our New York branch, here's some information about our New York branch. That's great. If I want to make any changes, it's just a really intuitive kind of uh, WYSIWYG experience uh, so that we can just get this application up and running and running everywhere. But it's this great experience. So what I want to do now is I want to take that back end logic that Eduardo had written 
that suggests which promotions that we should use, and I want to surface it here in an application. You'll notice we even have a convenient spot that says, what are your suggested successful promotions? And you see all these warning things because it's not connected to any data. So let's come back over here. Uh, this is the API definition, very similar to with what Eduardo was using before. And the reason that you'd want to use something like OpenAPI or Swagger is because now your clients can automatically discover the shape and size of your API without you having to tell it. So for Power Apps, this is fantastic, because the Power App will actually be able to say, oh, I know the exact methods that you have. I know the response to expect. I can deal with that. Similar as we move forward into Logic Apps in a few minutes, you get the same kind of rich experience once you have this definition. And it's great that we have those tools to do so. So you'll notice here that we actually have a button directly in the Functions portal to let you export to Microsoft Power Apps or Microsoft Flow. So before, if you wanted to connect two Power Apps from something like a function, it was like a 12-step process. You had to generate the Swagger yourself initially. You'd have to go save the Swagger somewhere, go import it, update it, everything else. I want to just show you how easy it is now. If I take that Swagger that Eduardo was working with before, I can even come in here and just say, hey, Express, push this up to Microsoft Power Apps, Microsoft Flow. If I'm authenticated, I can choose which environment I want to publish it to. And I'll just give this a name, Live Publish Function App. And I think Express is also something three days old functionality. That yes, we just very new. Use. I click OK. And what it's doing right now is it's going and talking to the Power Apps API. And it just registered this function as an API now that all my Power Apps can use. So it was just that easy. And now I can come in here to Power Apps. And if I choose this uh, category here, I can actually come in here to data sources. I'm actually feeling kind of brave. Uh, I'm actually going to try to add the one that I just created. And if it doesn't work, I have a backup, so that's fine. As so I'll come notice, in here. We have helpers to debug our stuff. Here, yes. So, yeah. uh, and what did I call it again? Live? I think I called it live. E-F-G-H-I-J-K-L. Live Publish Function App. It's right there. The one I just wrote looks great. That's what I want to connect to. And again, you'll notice we have a bunch of connectors out of the box to a bunch of different sources. I'll go into those in a little bit. So I can choose to connect to this function app and pull it into my application. Now, this is where it hit a hiccup. And for whatever reason, it's not letting me do a, a connection. But that's fine, because I have one ready to go. So now what I can do is I can say, hey, I want to stream this data from Eduardo's function app, which, in case you forgot, looks like this. It just returns a nice collection of different promotions and some images on that. And I'm going to tell my Power App that I want to pull in that data. So all I have to do in here is give it the name of my connection. And the one that I'm going to use now is actually called dogwash function. That's the one I prepared ahead of time. So I have autocomplete here. It says dogwash function .get promos, And now it just wants to know, it knows from that API definition that this operation needs an ID. It needs to know what the branch ID is. Well, if you'll notice on my application, I'm looking at a branch right here. And I actually already have the branch ID right there. So I can pass in data from my page, which in this case is called selected branch. And I'll say, pass in whatever branch ID is on that page. Now I'll zoom out here. And you'll notice that once I finish that expression, I actually got this nice uh, thing that just populated. It called Eduardo's function in real time. And it gave me the different promotions here. So if I even go and select like a different branch, maybe I choose our Seattle branch, since we're in Seattle, you'll notice it called the function and returned the promotions that would make sense at the Seattle branch in like the cutest pet competition, because that is just the, uh, the most adorable puppy picture I think we could find. Okay, So that just gives you a sense and an idea of how easily you can take those uh, back-end logic and surface it in applications. Obviously, you could have followed similar methods and used something like a traditional web app or mobile app. But Power Apps did provide us that extra agility as well. Uh, because again, this whole purpose that we're going for here is we want to uh, just get back to running our business and doing it successfully. So now with that, I'm actually going to transition over. Uh, and I'm going to talk a little bit about one more piece of technology, which is Azure Logic Apps. So Azure Logic Apps, uh, if you remember back from Eduardo's first slide, this is the second core piece of our serverless platform. And what Azure Logic Apps lets you do, instead of going and pasting in or writing that code like Eduardo did, Logic Apps lets you run workflows uh, using serverless. So it's serverless in the same way that you only pay for what you use. It will scale up to as many workflows as you need to execute. Uh, and there's no servers involved. 
Uh, but in this case, you kind of get to connect together your different function applications. So you notice here in this picture I have here, I'm listening to an FTP server. Whenever a file gets dropped on that FTP server, I'm going to run it through a few functions to process the data, drop something in Azure storage, send an email. The reason that I'm able to do this is because function includes over 125 connectors out of the box to different cloud and on-premises services. Again, if you think to just, I want to get this solution up and running as quickly as possible, this is a huge tool in your toolkit to say, hey, I need to go grab data from Salesforce, or I need to grab data from SAP, or Oracle, or SQL, or wherever else my data may be. Now I can just drop a step within my workflow, and that's done. And behind the scenes, there's a declarative definition that this designer is generating. So you can use that to check it into source control, do automated deployments, use it within our new Visual Studio tooling, and so on. So I mentioned that there's over 125 connectors out of the box. Uh, this is, I don't know, nine of the icons. Uh, there's much more. It is worth calling out, though, things like the Microsoft Azure connectors. So we've made a bunch of investments into other things like uh, either Cosmos DB or the cognitive services or storage and service bus, so that as you're working across these different platforms and Azure functions, obviously, uh, you can easily stream that data together and connect it to the services that you need. So with that, let's actually go into a Logic app. And I'm going to build one here. Uh, and we're going to connect it to our Power App. So I think. Oh, we do see it. OK. So you'll notice here, back in our Power App, I can select a promotion. But what I want to do is actually I want to add some functionality to run a promotion. So maybe in Seattle, we decide, Eduardo and I talk. We're like, hey, this cutest pet competition would be fantastic. It says that it helps us get a lot of foot traffic. Let's run this promotion. Well, in order to go run a promotion, there's a bunch of stuff that I need to do. I need to get the information for the promotion, generate a nice email, maybe a coupon go and figure out who all the customers I need to promote this to are, and send an email blast to all of those customers. That sounds to me like a workflow. Uh, so let's come over here to the Azure portal. And I have here a Logic app ready to go called Fire Campaign. It's kind of a weird word. I should have said like Start Campaign. Uh, but this is a blank Logic app here. You'll notice I could choose from a bunch of different templates, whether it's Service Bus or HTTP or even like uh, Edifact or X12. And I'm just going to start one from blank. And again, the first thing I want to call out here is just the number of out-of-the-box connectors that are supported. So again, there's over 125 of these. Uh, as I scroll down, you'll see things like SAP, SQL, Oracle. You'll probably recognize many of these icons. Now, in our case, I'm actually just listening for a request from an application. So I'm just going to say, you know what? Give me an HTTP endpoint. I want to just receive a request from some source. And we're going to get a request from that Power App. Now, I can even specify here in the designer, what will the Power App be sending you? And in this case, the Power App's going to send us one of those events. So I'm going to paste in, and I'm going to send it some information on the event that I want to fire. So we'll come back in here, and I'm just going to paste that in. So now the designer knows the, the object that's going to be coming through, and you'll see why that's useful as I start to add actions. So the first thing that I want to do now is I want to actually go and generate a coupon based on the promotion that we're going to run. So I can go ahead here and add a step. And you'll notice we have wonderful Azure Functions front and center. Uh, so I can choose to call an Azure Function within my subscription. Now what's happening is the designer is actually looking at my subscription right now. And I almost have this library of all my different functions. I love functions, so I have a bunch of these. Uh, all of my different functions in my subscription. So I can call and execute any of these across all of the Azure regions that I'm using Azure Functions uh, to stream together these workflows. So I have this one called build function, uh, aptly named. And I'm going to go ahead and open this one. And you'll notice I just have a single function in this app, which is called generate coupon, which should show up in just a second. There it goes. So I'm going to run this little bit of code, which just goes and gets the information on the promotion and gives us this nice, beautiful HTML email. I'm going to zoom out here so I get a little bit of the, uh, the designer more in here. Now I can pass in whatever information I need here. I could pass in this nice object if I wanted to. And I just want to point out quickly that the designer even knows that I'm going to have things like an image name, an image URL, because I told it what the payload it was going to be receiving was going to be. So I can just pass in whatever information I need to that function. Now here's another challenge in our development. Well, I need to figure out who all the customers I need to send this email to are. And for us, we're using CRM to manage our customers. Could be Salesforce, could be Dynamics, could be whatever. Uh, because we love Microsoft, we're using Dynamics uh, 365. And again, I don't have to go 
look into any API, figure out how do I authenticate with Dynamics, what does their API look like to add it into this serverless workflow, I can just simply choose the out-of-the-box connector. Say I want to list records from Dynamics. And since it's connected to my account, I can even select uh, with nice dropdowns the organization and the entity that I want to call. Again, just calling out the speed in which I'm able to build these applications, because I haven't had to go look at any API docs, figure out how the crap you get an access token to Dynamics and what their API methods are. And now I'm just going to list all of the accounts that we have so I can send emails to all of them. So last, just to finish this off, I'm going to go ahead and send an email. You'll notice here we have a bunch of ways to send emails. Maybe I'd do this through MailChimp or SendGrid. I'm just going to do it through Office for, uh, to keep it simple. So I'll go ahead and send an email. And let's send the email to the customer's email address. Right? I want to send it to their email from Dynamics. Uh, you'll notice if you are quick, it actually noticed that I'm going to have lots of email addresses because we have lots of customers. And so it automatically added a for each loop for us. So it's going to say for each of these records, send an email. So if we had 10,000 customers, it's going to send 10,000 emails and so on. Uh, this is the greatest promotion. And I could pass in you know, the title of the promotion. And let's pass in the coupon we generated from the Azure function. So hopefully that just gives you a feel of the kind of environment that you can use to build these Azure Logic Apps. I'll just show you quickly. I did this all in the portal. Uh, but I could have done this as well within Visual Studio. So you'll notice I'm actually showing the exact same Logic App here. I can even import a Logic App from the cloud and download it with this download button into Visual Studio. And what's great about this is I can edit and make changes, but I can also now deploy this Logic App and any dependencies that it may have, its Azure functions and the connections that I need as a part of it. And I could choose any resource group, any region in the world, and I would have this serverless workflow ready to go and ready to start promotions. OK, so that's that. I, would go, I could go through the same step in hooking this up and showing that you can run it. Um, but to keep it simple, let's actually just go ahead. And I'm going to show you one last thing. And this is the secret sauce. Because I think we've done a pretty good job here showing you how you can build serverless applications. Eduardo showed you how you can build serverless backends. I showed you a little bit how you can build serverless workflows and how you can surface this data in client applications like Power Apps to get you end results very quickly. But the last thing that I just want to emphasize is that there's a benefit to going serverless and using these tools more than just speed of development and reduced cost and abstraction of servers so that you don't have to worry about you know, as much operations as you traditionally would. And that's that as you begin to run this stuff in the cloud, as you're pulling this data and processing it in the cloud, you have a unique opportunity to tap into some of the power and potential that the cloud brings very easily. So there's one other feature in our application that I'm just going to show you. And after I show it to you, we'll, we'll take it apart. And that's this feature here where we actually provide grooming estimates. Now, we might be running different promotions in different events. And we might price different dogs differently based on the location. And we don't want our sales staff to be burdened down with figuring out, do we have a promotion right now? This is the breed of dog. How much do I cost them? We wanted to make this a much more uh, streamlined experience so that you can just walk into one of our branches, you show us your dog, and we can tell you on the spot, this is how much that dog is going to cost. Because in Seattle, where people love their dogs, we might be able to get away charging a little bit more than we would if we had a branch in maybe, I don't know, Fargo, where I hear they eat dogs, right? So it's just a <laughs> give and take. You got to figure out, you got to figure out what the right balance is. I apologize if anyone here is from Fargo. Love your show. Okay. <laughs> I got a well-deserved boo. I will take that. Okay. So here's this functionality in the app. I'll show it to you now, and then I'll just take it apart behind the scenes. You'll notice here it's got a camera, right? It's showing me, and I can give it a picture of a dog now. Does anyone have a suggestion of a breed for a dog that we should test this with? What is it? A West, a West in? A West D? I don't know dogs very well. So W E S. Testy. Oh, yeah, I see it. OK, Westy. I've never done this one before, so let's find out. So I've got a picture here of what I believe is a Westy. And I'm going to, this is, this is the risk here. I, I, why did I do audience participation? OK, so I'm going to take a, does that look like a Westy? Anyone can confirm. I'm just going to take a picture of that Westy. And I'm going to click Submit here. What it's actually doing is it's sending that up to a serverless application uh, with a West Highland White Terrier. That sounds like the official name. Uh, and what it actually did is it ran this through. Sorry, it cut off because the name was a little bit long. It ran this through the custom vision service. 
up in the cloud, which we just announced at Build, and it detected the breed of the dog. It was able to say that this was a dog, and it gave me a nice price right out of the box. It told me some stuff about it. It's sassy, loud, independent nature. Sounds a little bit like Eduardo. Um, <laughs> and so now, so now on site, I'm able to tell them instantly how much this dog costs. Boo. Yeah. <laughs> Two boos. <laughs> <laughs> Two moves. <laughs> so I'll just peel this apart and show you behind the scenes what's happening. This is the run that just happened to prove it. It's 11.14 right now, and this ran at 11.14. So this is all that happened, right? I got the request, which was that image. I created a blob in storage. I ran it through cognitive services to analyze the image. And then I used an Azure function to give me the price based on the location and the breed. You'll see I, hear, I knew here it was the West Highlands White Terrier. I knew the location of the branch. So I was able to give a price back. And then I just simply returned that response back to my application. So in what, five, six steps, and only two of these are, this is the only thing that's my own code. Everything else is a service in Azure or something else. Now I'm able to bring some really rich intelligence into my application. And this wouldn't be great if I didn't at least try. Now I want to see what it says about me, too. <laughs> <laughs> I'm curious if I'm more expensive to wash. So in the, I'm less. I'm cheaper. Okay, I'm only let's 20 a, bucks. Let's do a competition. Okay. <laughs> now it did. It does know <laughs> that I'm not a dog. Uh, this is great, though. I get along with just about everyone. Strong, active, gentle, and eager to please. Let's... You want to try, Eduardo? Might as well. We got time. <laughs> All right, let's see what Eduardo is, and then we'll get back to it. I told you we were going to talk about says it. Come false, on, be man. something so worse. Irish setter. Oh, this is beautiful. <laughs> we couldn't apply this better. Eager and a bit stubborn. Great jogging partner. I do but, jog. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> uh -huh. It's incredible. So this is actually the, the tech we're using for this one, very similar to the custom vision service. This is actually what dog. If you've seen it before, you can download the app. It's, it came from the Microsoft garage. But you can use things like that custom vision service. If you didn't catch the announcement, go check it out. You could build something just like this. You could go have it detect images of landmarks or people or celebrities or dogs. And you could build stuff like this in a few hours. And I think that's what gets us really excited about serverless technology, is that now putting that intelligence, putting that power into the hands of our developers enables them to build some very powerful, uh, and in this case, fun, uh, fun uh, stuff very easily. So with that now, uh, that's it for the Power App. And we're going to turn it over to Eduardo to talk a little bit about some more of the functions that we have within uh, Functions and CDS. Oh, actually, we didn't. We should do the, just as a heads up, as a recap before I do that. So this is what we built today, right? Just as uh, if you remember it. So we, we have a Power App. It's calling some Azure Function proxies so that we can abstract all these different endpoints. We're using logic apps, in this case, some custom vision stuff. We're using uh, table storage to grab images, and we're calling custom compute all with functions, uh, all within whatever, 50 minutes. Awesome. All right. So the last part here, and we saw there's a lot of Power Apps folks here, um, it's something we want to announce as well, is um, if you're familiar with Power Apps, uh, or even if you're not, one thing you have Power Apps that's very powerful, you have the common data services, which allows you to define all your business entities in a secure way, in a structured way, and you can operate them just as entities. That's the part that I like. Just like we operated our tables as entities, with CDS you can do the same. Just very recently we released the CDS SDK, and this CDS SDK is something you can leverage within your functions and operate against that data set. And that's brand new. For you to, to get started, um, you're going to use one of our one of our templates. So if you go into functions and you add a function, because it's brand new, it's actually um, on private preview right now. Um, we had in our experimental set section here. You go CDS C sharp um, because you're going to be talking to to a backend uh, data store. Uh, the warning here says you have to authenticate your endpoint. You have a feature in app service that works in function apps called Easy Auth, uh, and you could configure authentication endpoint, and you create um, your function. And that function already come with uh, all the code and all the references that you need to operate on CDS data. 
So you could go straight into the logic and create your own queries that will manipulate the data right there uh, within your functions and, of course, in a serverless manner. So, so that's very nice. So a lot of basic operations you can do within the Power Apps itself, but if you have some more complex logic, iterate over a bunch of records and, and joins, group bys, things like that, functions could, it's a great place for you to do it. So make sure you, you, um, you know about this. It's um, something we just, just released as well. Um, so I just want to re recap. Um, we talked about a bunch of new things, so um, proxies, requests, response, override that's brand, uh, brand new, the mock capability is new, or Swagger support is new, or CDS stuff is new. Um, we keep investing on making integration with Logic Apps better, and we'll keep going on this journey of making your lives as developers, of API developers and developers in general, to make it easier for you to accomplish all your business problems, solve them in a serverless fashion. Yeah, and um, I think uh, just to, I mean, we only had a certain amount of time here, and we wanted to give you a good perspective of the different serverless tools and how they work together. If you haven't yet had a chance to start and try out Azure Functions, or you haven't tried out Azure Logic Apps or Power Apps, really just take some time. You don't even, like, traditionally when you're working with some other tech, sometimes you're like, I'm going to take a whole weekend, right? And I'm going to see, at the end of this weekend, can I have something up and running? We've got a bunch of samples and videos, even on Channel 9, where you can just take 30 minutes. And within 30 minutes, you can start to have some pretty cool stuff up and running. Obviously, there's much more here that we weren't able to get into, um, whether it's that you want to do, like, monitoring of your functions using Application Insights, whether you want advanced patterns within your logic apps, like parallel executions, exception handling, convoys, whatever else you might want to do. It's there in the engine, uh, but at the very least, go get your feet a little bit wet, try something out, see if you can get anything cool like this going. And you really can, honestly. Just even if you said, like, every time someone uploads an image into OneDrive, run that through OCR in Azure, or run that through computer vision, use a function to pull out some information, Whatever you might want to do, uh, serverless not only makes it possible, but it makes it very easy to do so. The very last slide is just the sessions related to either serverless or to Power Apps, um, Flow. What we did here, by the way, integrates with Microsoft Flow in the same way. So here are some of the other sessions. Um, I think we're the last one of all these sessions, but they're available on Channel 9 for you to, to go back and, and watch them. Um, so we really want to thank you for taking the time and uh, yeah. listening. And since, yeah, thank you. Since we have such a big room, uh, if you have questions, it might be easier. You can either come up right after this ends. We've got to leave the room soon. But we also have a booth downstairs that we'll have our teams at. That's right. Uh, so if you have questions, feel free to come up uh, or meet us at our booth in about 10, 15 minutes. So thank you, everyone, very much for coming.